using the mind. <laughs> that shocked everybody who had to explain that he meant the minor prophets. Yeah. They are the shortest prophetical books in the Old Testament. And I'm going to invite you to turn with me to one of them today, the prophet Habakkuk. And for those who have difficulty in finding them, we come to meet at the Ashton Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> We all know the most general background for the Minor Prophets ministry, uh, the exodus from Egypt, the 40 years in the desert, the entry into the Promised Land. Uh, when the people were threatened, they demanded a king to bring them together. Saul was appointed, and then David, and then Solomon. Uh, and soon after Solomon uh, was appointed, there were still ructions within the community, and the ten northern tribes separated and became known by the name of Israel. The two southern tribes uh, were called Judah. 200 years later, Israel was captured by the Assyrians, deported, and the whole nation devastated. And as a nation, as that particular nation under that particular name, it never again will have any place in the world history. The two southern tribes, Judah, staggered on for another 140 years under a succession of good, bad, and indifferent kings until they, too, were captured and deported by the Babylonians. But that was not the end of their particular story, because in an amazing way, about half a century or so later, their exile was ended when God dramatically agreed to move the heart of a pagan king to allow them to be repatriated to their own country. So they did that, the first tranche of history now. We know nothing about his hometown, his background, his tribe, his occupation, his family, but if he is a mystery to us, our mystery is nothing compared to, and hear me very carefully, the problems that Habakkuk had with God. And that may come across very strikingly and sharply, but I promise you it's true. And you get the first problem right at the beginning of the first chapter. Verse 2, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or you or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Who says that the Bible is out of date? I haven't had a chance to read the newspaper this morning, but I can guarantee you that I will find most of those things reflected in today's headline. But this was Habakkuk's problem. It was not man's actions, and they were bad enough to cause some grievous concern, which I'm sure they did. What that troubled Habakkuk was not man's action, but God's inaction. God didn't appear to be doing anything. Look at the sheer Honesty of Habakkuk's words. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Uh, and the word listen has the rather deeper meaning of you don't listen and do something in response to the prayers. I'm sure not only of Habakkuk, but of a run of God and people who are praying with him. We sometimes use the phrase, prayer changes things. We're not going in scripture when we do that, but if the phrase doesn't appear in the Bible. What we need to ask ourselves is, does prayer change things? Uh, I don't know about that. I don't think, no, it changes nothing. I'm praying for all I'm worth, and nothing is happening. But he didn't give up there. Notice he asked, how long? So the issue is not whether God would answer the prayer. When we get to verse 5, we find God answering the prophet. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something. I'm going to say this very slowly. I am going to do something. I imagine that most, if not all, of us pray, some more regularly than others, some more passionately than others, that God would do something utterly new, radical, remarkable, amazing, in this needy country of ours. Uh, sometimes people have said to me something great written. I said, yes, it is great. Great in its fall from grace, great in its sin, 
Greater was disobedience to God's laws, uh, the highest divorce rate in Europe, uh, over 50% of the children born out of wedlock. Yes, it's a great country. It's great in the way in which it has rejected the ways of God. Well, uh, here was uh, Habakkuk saying, I'm going to do something. I imagine if an answer to your prayers about our nation, or indeed that I know you all have this uh, burden and passion for Europe, that you were quite convinced that God was saying to you, I am going to do something. Well, wouldn't that make your pulse quicken somewhat? You say, there is going to be an answer to my prayer. Now let's go on. I am going to do something in your days. Now, how much faster did your pulse run? Not only God is going to send, let's just call it revival, in Britain, in Europe, not at some vague indefinite time when they're all uh, gone, but in your day, you will live to see revival in your land. If your pulse doesn't quicken with that, I can recommend you with hospital <laughs> Of course it will. And God goes on, I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm not going to do something quite tiny, I'm not going to give a sort of token response to your prayers, I'm going to do something so remarkable, so radical, so amazing, so staggering, that if anybody else told you I was going to do it, you just didn't believe it. Well, I can imagine the prophet I present to the ministry. I mean, this is, the, I just can't wait. Lord, let's have it. And God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. And that, by the way, that means the Iraqis will take over. Same there. <laughs> so, and then we have the explanation that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own, then are feared and dreaded people, then are law to themselves, they promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk, their cavalry gallops headlong, their horsemen come from afar, they fly like a vulture, swooping to devour, they all come bent on violence, their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings, they scoff at rulers, they laugh at all fortified cities, they build earthen ramps and capture them, then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. And I say, no, no. Can you imagine how that is up to Well, can we come to this name like this because I don't, because he gives us his testimony in the land. Well, it was a Totally unexpected reply. And what made it even more amazing to have about the old guy, he had a great statement of faith. Now, I'm a creed old Christian. I believe in the value of great Christian creeds that can uh, that embrace true biblical truth. The Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Sixth Amendment, the Baptist Confession, you name it, there are many. Here is Habakkuk in. Chapter 1 and verse 12. O oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my holy one, we will not die. O oh Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O oh Lord, you have ordained them to come in your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate God. Well, that was what made God's answer even more inexplicable to Habakkuk. God was a God of sovereignty. And of utter holiness, he had zero tolerance of sin, and yet Habakkuk was being told by God, I am going to use in your nation the devastated, a country with whom I have no covenant, and you are a people with whom I do have a covenant. And yet I am using these godless uh, Babylonians to devastate your country in this way. Well, what was Habakkuk to do? Uh, go to verse 4, and you will see uh, it as part of the Lord's answer to these two things. Firstly, it was coming on the cross as you read our English Bibles, of course. Uh, see, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but he's confirming that everything uh, Habakkuk thought about the Babylonians was true. But the second part of the verse is addressed to God's people. The righteous will live. By his faith. Now, I don't suggest he, in fact, has a claim 
to read the latest verse in the entire Bible. It's so important that it's quoted three times in the New Testament, uh, once in Romans, once in Galatians, and uh, once in Hebrews. We have to read first with the Romans record, we won't look at the Galatians one, because it's very similar, and then we will look at Hebrews and come back to the other one. So turn with me to Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, we see that this verse is the key to salvation. Because this is the verse that God used in the uh, to trigger off the 16th century uh, Protestant Reformation in our beloved Europe. In those days, the continent was deeply dark utterly dominated by an unbiblical Roman Catholic domination. But there was a priest within their ranks uh, who had invested for years with the problem of how to get back to God. He joined the Herbert of St. Augustine, the strictest, uh, one of the strictest orders in the church, forward himself to the study of prayer and meditation and rituals. He says in my quote, I was a good man, and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was on. <laughs> he passed in the days on end, he slept without any bed clothing, without any blanket, almost frozen to death. He had an overwhelming sense of two things. The first was God's righteousness, God's holiness. And the second was his sin. And he knew that if he, if he was ever to get right with God, his sin would need to be confessed and forgiven. If it was to be forgiven, if not to be confessed, it would need to be remembered. But what if he couldn't remember every sin that he had committed and some remained unconfessed and therefore unforgiven? And it tormented him day after day. He was in a torment of guilt and fear and despair. I quote again, I was more than once driven to the very abyss of despair, so that I wished I had never been created. Love God, I hated him. And when he was in that frame of mind in the Roman church, I pointed him to lecture in theology. <laughs> and so he came eventually across Romans 1, and of course verse uh, 17 in particular. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. Well, that did it. That made things even worse. He knew about the righteousness of God. It was one of the two things that troubled him the most. And he knew the word gospel, but the, the gospel apparently did this. It showed, as he thought, the righteousness of God in capital letters, something that was bad enough in lower case. <laughs> The right, so what the gospel does is reveals black eyes in the open, puts in capital letters, and in bold the righteousness of God. Well, that drove him to even greater despair because it wrote his death sentence in even clearer letters. And then one day, the real truth of the world broke in. And he saw that the righteousness of God was not describing God, it was speaking about the righteousness that came from God, the righteousness God provided. And he saw for the first time the righteousness he as an individual sinner needed was the righteousness accomplished in the life of someone else, of Jesus, the sinless and eternal Son of God. And that what he needed to do was to abandon all the trust in his hopelessly sinful, striving, failing life, and instead put his trust utterly and entirely and completely in the one who in his life had shown, demonstrated, revealed, lived out the righteousness of God. I quote again, When I saw the difference, that the law is one thing, and the gospel another, I broke through. I felt myself to have gone through open doors into paradise. 
the young man made was not in the truth. And the rest of they say is just and this is the key to salvation. Jesus has fulfilled all the demands of God for the world. And the one who trusts in him is made right with God, not on the basis of his own efforts, however worthy or seemingly worthy they might be, but only because of Christ's name. All of his sins imputed to Christ, all of Christ's righteousness imputed to him. This is the key to salvation. And from then on, he was able to sing, or they had to do at that time. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood on me and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame of holy meaning on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And that is the best place biblically to begin our conscience is with God. Secondly, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And here we see that Habakkuk's statement is the key to perseverance. We take it that Hebrews was written to converted Jews, possibly living in Rome, and they were caught between a rock and a hard place. They were hated by the Jews, we find record about it all over the back. They were despised by the Romans, and so they had a great deal of suffering. Look at verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you received the light and you stood your ground. In a great contest in the face of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere, so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come, in, uh, will come and will not delay. So, in modern language, the uh, writer says to these battered Hebrews, hang in there. And he puts before them the two great promises uh, that you will receive in the verse 36. You will receive what he has promised. At the end of this life, there is a fuller life, a better life, an eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth, in the glorious presence of your God and so forth. Oh, and there is uh, another promise uh, linked to it. He who is coming will come and will not delay. So he puts before them the promise of eternal life and glory and the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, he said, that, that's the situation in which you are at present. These two wonderful promises. But what should they do in the, in the meantime? Well, you have the answer in verse 38. But my righteous one will live by faith. And that message comes straight through to me and to me today. We too have that great eternal promise of the fullness of life and glory in the new heavens and the new earth. And we also have the promise of the second coming of the Lord Jesus to usher in that new and wonderful and endless and sinless and glorious experience. The uh, second coming of Jesus is mentioned 300 times in the New Testament, once for every 13 verses in Matthew's Revelation, and not once with a scintilla of doubt about it. But we don't see the new heavens and the new earth with the eye of flesh, nor do we see Jesus with the eye of flesh, so we need to take both by faith. That is a foundational principle of the Christian life. We live, says Paul, by faith, not by sight. So we don't know how the swirling circumstances of life fit in to God's eternal plan, and we don't need to know. In some Christian circles, there is an eccentric craving for signs and wonders and words of wisdom, an extra biblical revelation, uh, something instant that will uh, take up your place where you are not now, and it is unhelpful. And it is eccentric because it dismantles the principle of faith. 
Let me put it instead. Tell me Erickson Fowler. You remember her story of the uh, Erickson? Uh, diving as a teenager into the water from Chesapeake Bay, coming out of the Chesapeake and remaining so for the remainder of his father her life with cancer as it could. And Tony says this quote, when we learn to lean back on sovereignty, fixing and settling our thoughts on that unshakable, unmovable reality, we can experience great inner peace. That is important. Our troubles may not change. Our pain may not diminish. Our loss may not be restored. Our problems may not fade with the new dawn. But the power of those things to harm us is broken as we rest in the fact that God is in control. We are called to trust God even when we cannot trust Him. And the just shall live by faith is the truth of his years. Now back to Habakkuk uh, chapter 2. Going back with me. And here we have the key to understanding history. We know the situation. God is going to execute judgment on a covenant nation with one that with whom we have no covenant. Sounded preposterous. What should believers do in that situation? And the answer was they should live by faith. And nothing to do more well than just as we live in this in between time between the giving of the promises and the receiving of them. And the in between time has been very difficult. No matter what age we are, these moments swirling around us in the international headlines, in the international conflicts, in intranational heartaches and problems and bloodshed and pain and violence and immorality and injustice and fear and the most appalling death toll. What is happening? The answer is that God is working out His eternal, unchangeable, and perfect purposes for the glory of His name and for the good of His people. Romans 8 28 is still in my Bible this morning. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Oh, and by the way, in the early Calvary faith, all rights for the worthy of science, which we would call the second law of thermodynamics. Is that the whole place is cracking up. We don't have to use that language. <laughs> um, but we shouldn't have that. No, we can't have that. Um, we're groaning in travail uh, as in the pains of childbirth. Everything seems to be going the wrong way. But we know that all things, including, as Paul would say, the things I've just told you, they are working for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. I come from the time I have a currency, as no one has here, unfortunately. And um, my father was a greenhouse laborer, and uh, they had a hobby of repairing watches. I mean, real watches, you know, the sort of thing that we still remember. And you know, <laughs> open the back of a watch and there were sprockets and fingers and cogs, some going this way, some going that way. Looking utterly chaotic, making no sense at all until what? Until you got to the other side. And you saw that all of those big wheels and little wheels and levers and things that were seeming to be so confusing and to have no explanation. We're all leading to that kind of movement in one certain direction. And everything is moving in one certain direction. Even in the opposite seems to be the case. And the devil seems to have the upper hand. William Bernal, one of my favorite children, said God puts his eggs under the devil for him to hatch. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing is, as we come to the close, that Habakkuk eventually got his own message. Turn to the last chapter in the book. Is it just one page on the book? Turn. Verse 16. Now you can. Here's how I'm telling us what happened when he heard that message that I'm sure you've heard. I heard 
and my heart pounded, and my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Well, that's what I call honest truth. That's exactly my heart. I was I was a quivering jelly when I heard that message from the Lord. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the earth and take my seat. And then he looks ahead to what might happen to him to make his life back. So the fig tree does not die, there are no grapes in the vines, the olive crop fails, the fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stores. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to go on the path. Abacus' faith is not in his own faithfulness, but in the faithfulness of God. Philip Luther was a close friend of John Newton. Uh, he was a well known hymn writer. But it had depressive elements and periods in his life. And one night, when he was feeling the lowest of moods, he called for a coachman and asked to be taken out to the banks of the river Ouse. His intention was to commit suicide. But the coachman got lost and eventually told Peter, Sir, I don't know where we are. And Peter said, Well, find a lot somewhere, see if you see a light. Made for it, and then we can get out there. And the coachman saw a light eventually and made for it. And when he got there, he discovered that they were not there. And Peter wrote some time later God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform, he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints. Fresh courage, take the cloud be so much better, and big with mercy, and will break with blessings on your head. This purpose is to invite and pass, unfolding every hour. But life may have a bitter taste of sweet to be blessed. May God bless you. So much, John. Very good challenge, as always. Yes, and uh, the humor too. Thank you. <coughs> so, uh, we're gonna, if uh, you like, just take a little change around here now, but then um, set in one right on time. Uh, perfect timing. So, if you just want to just chat for a second while we set up some technical things, please do. And uh, just get on stretch your legs if you want to. But don't go too far. I, I was going to suggest going out a cup one. The issue is if you don't have a cup, you'll kill and you'll never go back. But if you are cool, you can do it. There's water here, there's water here, there's prayer. So help yourself to that as we just bring the technical stuff to bear. So. <laughs> Why is that what they use a very nice other stuff? You know who it is, you probably know some of the things I'm going to say. Um, I'll try and start here and then go to the top of the mountain. And virtually immediately I got started on a project that must be three classes, uh, which brought the wind to the same name there, Carbon 400. I'd like to note this, that, oh, hello, <laughs> that next year is actually the 25th harvest of a hundred. <laughs>